Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation in Virtual Mode. We have about, I guess, about 170 videos on the same sorts of subjects that we were covering in the real world in on our website, and they get quite a number of hits. Uh, I'm delighted that we're able to cover the same things as we were covering last year, I guess. Uh, and obviously, Brussels is one of the most important issues and what is going to happen to the UK's financial services sector. Uh, after January the 1st, um, the, the specific challenges that are coming up, the specific opportunities. Uh, I noticed that the Financial Times has been doing a series of big reads on, on what's going on in Brussels and how the UK financial services sector can, uh, can cope uh, and perhaps thrive. Um, so I'm delighted that we've been able to put together a very eminent panel. Uh, Kay Swinburne is, as I'm sure all of you know, the former vice chairman of Econ, the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee at the European Parliament. She's now the vice chairman of financial services at KPMG UK. She was a conservative MEP for Wales from 2009 to 2019. She was also a member for what it's worth of the US EU parliamentary delegation and current relevant in the current circumstances, has a PhD in medical uh, medical research from KCL. Uh, Andrew Gray is equally eminent, a global head of Brexit and for financial services at PwC UK, a member of the uh, Brexit Steering Committee and a partner at PwC, I can't believe this, but I read it, a partner for 30 years at, uh, at uh, PwC, quoted recently in the New York Times as saying that Brexit is nipping at London's role as a financial powerhouse and that uh, you will lose the economies of scale as we leave the European Union single market. And as it were, butting cleanup and providing the usual gloom that a lawyer does, uh, Michael Sholem, uh, special counsel at Cadwallader or Cadwallader Wickersham and Taft. Taft, I can never remember if they've actually formally cut out the last two uh, in, here in London, focusing on fintech and financial regulation. He joined in April 2013 from Davis Polk, where he was also European counsellor. My colleague Jane Fuller and I will add any questions if we if we feel it's needed. But that's the running order. And I'm going to ask, first of all, Kay, Kay to tell us what you think is the future of the City of London and how it can either thrive or survive in a post uh, single market Europe. Thank you, Andrew. And it's good to be here with you. But I think for me, I'm going to have to preface everything I say with I'm an optimist. And I also believe in the innovation of the financial sector in London. So I am actually fairly optimistic that even though there may be some short term pressures and some short term movements of trading activity in particular out of London into the EU as a result of no equivalence or limited equivalence decisions being taken, I do believe that London will keep its position as a global financial centre, although it may be diminished in the short term in terms of volumes and it may be diminished in terms of the EU's own numbers, but actually it has been a global financial centre for a number of decades, and I believe that that's the way it will stay, provided that the UK government recognises the importance of financial services and recognises the importance of a good regulatory framework that actually suits the customers they're trying to serve. So there are some caveats in there, but I mean, my ultimate sort of goal is that London stays a preeminent financial centre. But the pressures at this point in time, particularly from the EU, are that they believe that being reliant on any other part of the world for something so important as raising capital for their companies is too difficult. So they would like to see much of that capital raising activity taking place within the EU 27. So that for them means that they need to use every lever possible to try and actually drive some of that business out of London into some of the EU27 markets. And principally, they're going to go to markets like Paris, to Frankfurt, and to Amsterdam, potentially Dublin, Luxembourg, and maybe a few sort of going elsewhere, but very, very few will go to other markets. So those are the, the markets, but as you've just heard, there's at least five markets, so it's not one. They haven't chosen one financial center 
where there will be one set of rules where everybody will move to the same place and create a new ecosystem within the EU27. So there's going to be at least five ecosystems that are being promoted and competing with one another. So do I think five centers competing with each other as well as competing with other global financial centers are ultimately going to win out? No, I don't. Until the EU decides that they want one capital market in one location with one set of rules, that I think is going to be very difficult for them to pull all of that business, particularly for global companies raising capital, where the, the cost of raising that capital is important, then I think they're actually always going to be a minor player. And the reason I say that is, is simply because ultimately you have different rules for insolvency, you've got different rules for withholding tax, you've got very big fundamental differences in the way as an investor your money gets treated or indeed as a company raising money potentially you get treated. So there are all sorts of issues there. We had securities law legislation as a package put on the table when I joined the parliament in 2009. It actually never saw the light of day. It by various member states was taken off the table because they thought it was too difficult. The Giovannini barriers were identified back over 22 years ago. Uh, poor Professor Giovini, Giovini we, since then has recently passed away. He always joked with me over dinner that this would happen, that he would actually not see these barriers come down in his lifetime. It's really sad to see that only a few of those barriers were taken down. And indeed, they were taken down by the ECB when they did target two securities and when CSDR was done putting a framework in for settlement. Other than that, none of those barriers have been removed. So there isn't a single capital market. Does that mean that European companies are going to raise funds in the EU short term? Yes, probably because there's significant pressure on them by their member states to do so. Does it mean that they're going to do that long term when they're at a comparative disadvantage with their peers elsewhere around the globe? I think not, I think they will move their business. Whether it's to London, is for London to win that business. But I mean, New York, Singapore, other regions emerging around the world may well be cheaper for them to actually raise the capital more local to where they need to use it. So I think, you know, there are all sorts of pressures here. So you can use the stick short term to drive business towards you. You cannot over the long term expect that to work. You need the carrot. You need that very efficient capital market with a low cost of raising funds. And if you haven't got that, you cannot keep that market any more than, than you know, anyone else around the globe would be able to do it through forcing it. So for me, London needs to remain competitive. There are lots of things the UK needs to do to make itself competitive and to make sure that it has the entire ecosystem within its own shores right now. It doesn't. So it's always relied upon Luxembourg and Dublin for listing of funds. Those funds need to actually now have a good framework that they could choose to actually be domiciled in the UK and therefore actually not be subject to the EU rules for funds and for where the funds trade. You also need to make sure that you have a good tax system. You need a very efficient mechanism for post-trade. So I would suggest that the UK needs to actually look very carefully on its post-trade systems and how it actually makes sure that those efficiencies are passed on to all the customers globally. It has as, and has had for a long time the overseas persons regime. That regime needs to be enhanced and make sure that it works for us as an independent country without the set of EU, EU rules behind us or indeed holding that back. And the reality for me is that London became a preeminent global financial center because of Big Bang. It realized the benefits of the electronification of markets and moved quickly to take that leadership role. We are on the cusp of new digitization of the financial markets. We have to be on the leading edge of that, which means we need a policy and framework, regulatory framework in particular, that allows the digitized assets to be traded in London as a leading vanguard player in this space. We can't allow the rest of the world to, to do this, to test it, to actually run it, we need to be up there with those leading countries, making sure we as a global financial center are leading and setting that framework for the rest of the world to follow. If we do that, I think we will have a really bright city of London. 
It may have dip in the short term, but over the longer term, I think we've got a very positive message. And I do know that the UK government and all of the, the Treasury teams and the regulators are currently looking at that future digital market. Um, we're doing a government fintech review, which I have the, the honor of actually chairing the chapter on policy and regulation and has spent the last six months looking at that digital agenda. I think it's doable. There is seemingly a political will, and I hope the regulators will also be able to follow through because we have a good set of people who should be able to deliver this for us. So a lot of work to be done and certainly not sitting back on their laurels, but the reality is there'll be short-term pressure, but I think if we respond in the right way to that future digital market, then London will have a solid role as a future global center. Okay. Yeah, you You've obviously focused on the digital agenda, but you also raised two other things that the UK has to do, in your opinion. One is it has to change the fund, uh, the, the legislation around funds. And secondly, that it needs to do more on the overseas uh, persons regime and then the post-trade uh, area. Could you just expand a little bit on what you want the government to do in those two areas? So certainly on the funds regime at this point in time, it is not a, a, a conducive market to actually domicile your fund in the UK for various tax reasons in particular. But there's certainly a lot of movement right now and there have been some announcements in the last few days and certainly a lot of pressure has gone on from various city trade bodies, in particular the city UK has called for that funds regime to be improved and that the tax system around it to become the most competitive globally. And that has been backed up by work with the Investment Association, who've done a very detailed analysis on what it would take for the UK to become that preeminent position for you know, your listing of funds. So it's even if it's only new funds we're choosing to list in the UK, that would be a phenomenal addition to our ecosystem. If we can potentially get that system so that it is so good that people want to repatriate some of those funds that are domiciled elsewhere, that would be even better. So I do think that that is, is a missing piece of our jigsaw. It was discussed early in the coalition government in 2010, and I was part of those discussions as to the UK taking on uh, a new role in funds, in the domicile of funds. And we shelved those plans in the UK back then because Ireland was in difficulty and we felt it was important to support the Irish financial services ecosystem. And therefore, we step back from putting that legislation on our statute books then. I think now is the time to not just put it on our statute books, but to do it very, very quickly. We need to actually be you know, that place where people would choose to come so that they would actually put those assets within the UK. Um, in terms of the overseas persons exemption, it was always a thorn in Brussels side. They never, ever were comfortable with that regime. And therefore, I think we've curbed some of the um, ability for that to be extended um, within the, the EU as a full member. So I think now is the time to really look at that overseas persons regime and actually see what we might be able to do further to encourage those individuals who could trade anywhere globally, particularly in the, the space, for example, of derivatives trading. We need to actually make it easier for them to actually do so. And we need to make them feel welcome. I think it's important we have a very strong regulatory system that doesn't put people off, but we need to actually make sure that everything else is aligned to allow them to participate safely in our markets and, and to actually adhere to our rules, but have a system specially tailored for them as non-domicile entities. Jane, do you want to, to come in on that? Um, I suppose um, th this... I love the, the optimistic view, um, but there's this, I'm just wondering, I hate to use the phrase cake and eat it, um, but there's a tension here between the UK having um, a really strong regulatory environment um, in terms of, uh, you know, anti-abuse and all the rest of it, but also being relaxed enough to be attractive. And I'm sure we're going to come, come on to equivalence and maybe we should move on to some other speakers now, but, you know, ca can you actually do that juggling act um, between having a robust regime and, oh, by the way, it won't, won't feel nearly as restrictive as, as the okay, other. Well, let, well, let's actually bring in Andy, uh, uh, Andrew Gray. I mean, what's your, your view on this? And particularly, do you share, I, I guess, the, the broader, reasonably optimistic outlook presented by Kay? 
Yeah, I mean, I'll, I, I, I genuinely do uh, feel reasonably optimistic. Uh, and I think we've got to recognise a, a number of important facts, some of which will echo what, what Kay said, not I'll build on a few points. I mean, th- I think philosophically, uh, London, the UK, has, has always seen itself as an international market for the world and, and, a, and a place where you know global financial institutions can base themselves, operate from, a number of the components that, that Kay said, um, and the international internationalisation of London generally over many many years, I think, has been been an incredibly valuable asset to the country, and one which we need to recognise. Um, when we've done an analysis about the, the the percentage of that international business that is related to the, the rest of the EU, actually, it's it's a relatively small percentage. Relative, I mean, it's significant in its own right, but it, but it's it's not the major reason why London exists. London exists and being so successful because of its global nature, not it, not just its relationship with the EU. The, 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 the disruption of uh, the UK leaving the EU, clearly, you know, and in some cases, there are lots of examples of the UK being attractive because of its access to the EU. Um, and that, that's known, and that's something that the, the, the will have to be adjusted for. But I think that the combination of, you know, it's it's you know, an integrated financial centre like no other uh, in Europe or the European time zone. You know, it's got insurance, it's got, you know, asset management, appreciate the points on funds, um, you know, the London market for insurance. So so it's a place and a very small location where where financial services is, is very integrated and has built up substantial expertise, substantial knowledge and a culture of doing business. Um, and I think one of the things I'd like to make sure we highlight is, is the, the people aspects of it. You know, it's slightly odd. You know, we're all we're all operating remotely now, and we can all do that. But actually, you know, we, we are going to come back together. And it, and and the the culture, the 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 way of doing business, um, and the openness of the UK for people across the world to come to to London and be able to you know come into financial services. Uh, develop their careers, develop their life, um, and, and it's about you know a number of the, the both hard and soft factors that that make London an incredibly attractive place for people to come to do business with in financial services. So I think one of the things that, that the UK government needs to think very carefully around is making sure that the UK as a whole is seen as as an attractive place to come to and come to do business in. Um, I think Brexit has, has resulted in you know a bit of a bit of a, you know individuals' reactions to stand back from that, and certainly you know the, the rules will change, particularly for Europeans to come here. But I nevertheless think that the the, the way in which we approach immigration and and and, uh, and topics around the, the people agenda are fundamentally important. I think looking forward, London has been incredibly innovative over many years in terms of financial services. And I think that the two two key drivers of that going forwards. Uh, will be around fintech and and it will be around uh, the whole ESG agenda. And I think those are two topics again where uh, you know the, the combination of the education sector, um, corporate social responsibility more broadly, um, the government sector, um, all need to work together and and head in the same direction to support innovation um, and to support you know what what's going to be required, not just you know. In 2021, post leaving the EU, but actually in the next 5, 10, 15, 30 years' time around these topics are really going to be important. So, a much more forward looking agenda is key. That's going to need to be supported by regulation. We touched on that a little bit. I think that the, the, the one of the interesting things about the way in which the UK uh, regulatory environment will inevitably develop is that. Uh, the relationship between legislation and regulation will change and it will be slightly different. So I think you will see much more high-level policy being set by through Parliament, but a, but a much greater percentage of the regulation being involved by regulators, uh, which I think it should have, if done in the right way, a number of key benefits. One, it will be able to evolve more rapidly. Uh, and, and be more specifically tailored at the needs of uh, UK financial services in the context of its, its global role. Um, I think it will uh, hopefully be able to demonstrate that it is both robust and 
and predictable, which I think is really important so that, that firms know how regulation will apply to them and they know how regulation will evolve. So a, a, a more predictable forward-looking view. I absolutely think it needs to be robust and to the point that Jane made earlier. You know, we can't have an environment where there is somehow a, a relaxation of, you know, regulations which is there for a very good reason, so sanctions regimes, you know, be, be one example. You know, we've got to be uh, absolutely rigorous in the way we we, we treat uh, firms for the rule of law and, 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 and you know, general uh, conduct matters and support you know, the, a broad conduct agenda. Um, but we need to recognise that uh, the world evolves. I mean, Kay was making some comment about how long it has taken the EU to deal with CMU. Um, you know, that, that those sorts of delays you know, generally hurt economies because the you know, financial services exist for a purpose, and that's to ensure that you know capital flows can move from where they sit in one place to where they can be deployed most effectively for the economy as a whole. The better we can do that, you know, the more successful the UK is going to be, but also the sector is going to be. Um, so, I, I, and I do struggle to think through, you know, what are going to be the implications of future regulatory divergence in that regime where. You know, the EU will continue to, to legislate, the UK will, will, will regulate. And I think that you know, equivalence is going to be one of the, the challenges around that. We've seen already that there have been you know, certain limited emergency temporary equivalences granted from the EU to the UK around clearing, um, but not, not, not very broadly. Uh, and obviously things like securities trading obligations, share trading obligations are immediate concerns. But the whole ability to transact securities across the EU from the UK and the MIFID II clearly is, 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 is not something that we would necessarily expect firms to be able to rely on at any point in the immediate term. And then there's a question mark about, you know, you know firms will have already adjusted by then. So I think that equivalence will potentially uh, will become less of an issue because firms will have adjusted. But I think that the actual damage that, that, that will be suffered because of that will largely be corporate in the EU who are not as easily able to access you know, the best products, the most liquid pools of, of capital. Um, and and, and you know, it's going to actually be uh, you know, more of a limitation for Europe in some ways than it is going to be for the UK um, or the rest of the world. So I think there are some real interesting dynamics about how quickly the UK can adapt. The sooner it adapts, the sooner it can set out a clarity around the direction it's going in, um, which is, is part of the industry itself, but actually requires you know, government to, to, to also be more committed and more vocally committed, I think, to the financial service sector than it has been in the past. Um, but I think that can set the trajectory, and the UK undoubtedly is going to have uh, you know, a period of adjustment, and that's financial services as well as the rest of the economy, which will be damaging. But in the medium and longer term, I think there's every reason to be optimism, but, but, but it's not going to happen by luck. It's going to happen because specific policy interventions are going to occur. I mean, I'm fascinated what, to, to know your response to what Kay was talking about, the short term. In the, in the short term, Kay was suggesting that um, the EU will try to, to take business away, but precisely because it has to be... Uh, dispersed amongst five financial centers that won't be it won't be successful in the medium or longer term but um the myreb mcginnis uh, interview that she gave uh, was very clear that in the short term the eu is interested in maximizing the cost to the city of london of dropping of of uh, losing access to the single market i mean do you how how seriously do you take myreb mcginnis's comments well i th i think w w one of the the, the things I struggle with is is um, the idea that somehow you know we can control markets you know and, and control markets which have evolved over a significant period of time. I mean you know if you, I mean take clearing as as an easy example. You know the, the you know clearing has evolved. I mean you know because interesting enough the reason why clearing is so significant today is because of because of government interventions after the financial crisis. Requiring firms to clear and requ requiring firms to clear in in you know smaller number of clearing houses because that's where you know risks could be netted down to the greatest possible extent. Um, so you know it's somewhat perverse in a way that you know all of a sudden you know a group of you know, one political movement doesn't like the idea that 
you know, the clearing houses that they were keen to support because they're in London um, are, are the right solution. You know, it, it, the, 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 the European Commission is very much focused on, you know, if it's for Europe, it must be in Europe and controlled by Europe. Um, and I think that that misses the point that that may not be the best way of either managing risk or supporting capital market flows. I think you know you can't avoid the fact that a significant proportion of capital which ends up being deployed in Europe doesn't originate in Europe. And I think you know to try and ring fence Europe from a capital perspective, I think is to the detriment of Europe. Uh, Michael, your your view on this? Um, well, thanks. Um, I think I agree broadly that in the medium term. You know the future for London and the UK is is brighter than perhaps we might have anticipated a few years ago. Um, I think in the short term, what I'm hearing sort of both from Kay and Andrew, but also from clients, is it, it's lose lose in terms of the disruption on both sides of the channel from trying to um, deal with with the break uh, in terms of legislation. Um, I, I agree very much with Andrew that, um, particularly in the fintech space, um, the openness of London is a key attribute that needs to be maintained, and that includes in relation to visas. So when I talk to fintech clients, for example, one of their key concerns, and, and I've said this all along, is being able to attract German, Swedish programmers at, at, and entrepreneurs to come and set up in London um, and maintain that fintech ecosystem. So hopefully there'll be a unified government approach on, on visas and immigration. Um, I think very much, you know, fintech and ESG are going to be the, the fast growing areas in London during 2021 and, and beyond. Um, but I think it'll also be interesting how we manage to cope with divergence between the EU and the UK when it comes to the regulatory architecture for fintech and ESG. Um, so, and I suppose finally, I, I was slightly credited at the beginning as being a pessimist in all of these things. And I, I, I can sort of give a mere culpa a little bit and say, clearly the results of the referendum have not been as catastrophic as some have predicted in terms of the numbers of jobs moving out of London um, for in the financial services market. I would just say as well though that I and, and others in the lawyers and accountants and consultancy uh, world did spend a lot of time in sort of 2017, 2018, proposing uh, a financial services chapter of a treaty that we put in place between the UK and the EU. We talked about equivalence plus, we talked about all kinds of arrangements and, and how easy it should be to reach an agreement on that. Um, I wouldn't go as far as to say it was oven ready, but um, you know, the, because we would start from the same place, it would be incredibly easy for the EU to grant equivalents. Um, some of us were less optimistic about that because of the political nature of equivalents. Uh, and we've ended up where we are, it, which is a place that, as I said at the beginning, um, I think probably damages both sides in, in the short term, just because of the, uh, the confusion and, and the cost that's involved in dealing with separating two regulatory frameworks. That's that's my sort of preliminary view, but I, I can talk a bit more about some of the detail and challenges that are facing clients in, in the short term as well. Well, just do, just give us a sense of what your clients are worried about for the next the next six months, I mean, uh, over this, this transitional period. Well, I think there's, there's sort of, you starting with the most immediate and then going out into the to the future. So the most immediate problem is, is the practicality of frankly, repapering arrangements to reflect the fact that there will be two different regimes in um, in January. So that, that can be as simple as simply making sure that you have in your risk factors of your offering documentation or, or in your contracts, the correct referencing of say the EU securitization regulation and then the onshored version of the, um, the, the UK securitization regulation. Then there's the question of the onshoring process itself um, and what changes have been made by that process, which has led to the fact that we'll have some divergence from day one in terms of uh, the 
um, onshore legislative provisions. And some, there's some examples of that around uh, in, in the securitization regulation in terms of the interpretation of the requirement to do due diligence on securitization regulations. In the um, securities financing transactions regulation, the UK has decided not to implement the reporting obligation for non-financial counterparties, whereas the EU will have that uh, reporting obligation. Um, we, it looks likely that we will have a, a different version of the benchmarks regulation in place, not least to, uh, to deal with our proposals to deal with the end of LIBOR, which is scheduled to happen at the end of 2021. So just those, those are three examples, but all through the onshore legislation, and there are small but important differences in the way the wording is, has been done. Um, and then the other point that's quite key for a lot of clients, particularly some of the bigger ones, is that the onshoring process will not involve the onshoring of level three guidelines produced by ESMA, the EBA, EOPA, or the Q&A that were produced in great detail and volume, say, in relation to the European Market Infrastructure Regulation or in relation to MAR. The UK regulators have come out and said, look, we, we expect that you still will be able to look to that Q&A guidance and, and guidelines, but none of that will sort of be part of the UK financial regulatory architecture from day one. Um, and it will, of course, be open to the FCA and the PRA to take a different view from um, opinions that are expressed in those Q&A. And the Q&A, while non-binding, often actually reflect quite key policy choices or interpretation questions. So that, that's another challenge for clients in terms of dealing with that uncertainty. Other challenges uh, are involved just simply the mechanics and papering of arrangements to service clients in the EU. Um, and that, that can depend on what regime you're talking about. It can depend on whether or not you have a, a jurisdiction like Ireland, that, for example, is, is open essentially to managers managing some fund activity, provided they're only dealing with uh, professional clients, essentially. And then another area of practical difficulty is uncertainty around flows of data uh, that come from the EU into the UK. Uh, I'm not an expert on data protection um, law, but that is that is another area that, that's been flagged to me. So onshoring and repapering are the sort of immediate issues. Um, I think then the longer term issues are all around the future of the UK regulatory framework. So the UK government has proposed this UK future regulatory framework review, and, and we're on phase two of that. They published the phase two consultation in October, closes in January. And that's really to reflect the fact that FISMA and the UK financial services regime is not and never has been an exact match for the EU land for Lucy process that was introduced in the, in the noughties, um, where you have the level one framework legislation, level two sort of delegated regulation with all the detail, level three guidance, level four enforcement in theory. Um, and so the UK government has said, look, we, and as Kay mentioned, or maybe as Andrew, we need to um, ensure that the regulators have power to actually make a lot of the rules rather than have it have to flow through the UK Treasury and through Parliament. So Parliament essentially will set the framework legislation um, and UK regulators will be delegated a lot more of the power to actually do the, the rulemaking. And uh, at the moment, on all of that onshore legislation, including all of that level two legislation is sitting on the statute book. What the UK government seems to be saying is we would prefer to have all of that detail contained in regulatory rulemaking uh, with the PR and the FCA having much more control over that. that that's a, a massive simplification of what is a 50 page consultation, but that, that's, that's how I read it. And, and then finally, prospects for equivalence. Um, I think the EU has uh, granted equivalence in the areas it feels it's to its benefit, in particular in relation to clearing and the status of the three main London clearing houses, because that would have had a, uh, a major impact on, um, uh, on European banks in terms of the capital they would have had to hold in terms of their exposures to unrecognized clearing houses, but also, and, and the follow on from that is a, a threat to financial stability. But in other areas, of course, the EU has been very slow in granting equivalents. You know, the, 
the withdrawal agreement was designed so that we were meant to ideally reach a an agreement on equivalence by the middle of 2020 and we we didn't come close to that um so i think uk clients and eu clients are going to be keeping a watching brief on whether equivalence will happen in under MIFIA, the share trading obligation for example uh, across lots of different areas and i think um you know i think the mood at the moment is that the uk will diverge in a way that will make it more difficult to get the political will in brussels to um to grant equivalence i think that's not necessarily a bad thing because as we said the uk for example wants to have its own esg regime it's not going to implement the um the financial disclosures regime it will have its own version of the taxonomy so it won't be implementing the taxonomy regulation and neither of those are onshored because they're not scheduled to come into force until march 21 and then um january 22 in the case of the taxonomy and i think it's 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 perfectly possible that the uk will have a more sensible um accessible less bureaucratic versions of those regimes for the creation of green products um, in the financial markets and, and sustainable finance and that that can only be a good thing and, and maybe that's where i can end on an optimistic note <laughs> saying that uh that you know we may have a more practical regime that doesn't involve uh very prescribed formats of disclosure for example which is always the approach that frankly esma and eba have been keen on um so maybe we'll have a a more flexible regime in the future that will be attractive. Well, let's hope the, the problem is how to get from here to there. Can I ask Kay and Andrew to respond on, on what they're hearing from Michael? I know Jane has a couple of points as well, but Kay and Andrew first. Kay. We're hearing a very similar story um, that, that, you know, onshoring of legislation causes its own problems. And, you know, it, it's, a, it's a, a point in time when actually this legislation doesn't stay static. So the reality is that the EU is already changing a large number of pieces of regulation for capital markets. So there's an emergency COVID uh, piece of legislation going through at the moment, which will be on the statute books, I imagine, before the end of the year, which changes significant parts of MIFID too. It changes prospectus regulation, it changes um, capital requirements regulation, and I think there's a, 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 a hint to a change on um, the benchmarks regulation too. So they, they're changing things daily. Um, they've got big proposals in the mix that fundamentally change the way that they regulate the markets. So you know, when we talk about equivalence, we talk about the UK diversion. We shouldn't forget that the EU system is designed to be constantly evolving. In every piece of legislation, there is a two or three year review built in, which means it's not static. So when my EU colleagues talk about, you know, the UK is going to diverge, diverge from what? Because you're actually moving the goalpost every single time you review a piece of legislation. So, you know, equivalence was never intended to be line by line. It was always intended to be outcomes based. And because it's a political decision, you know, the reality is, you know, I was sitting at the table and, and was negotiating MIFID too. And I know that that share trade obligation was brought in at the very last minute as a political sop to a particular country and a particular political uh, domain and dimension within the parliament. It was brought in because they said, if you've got a derivatives trade obligation, surely it's a good thing to actually take that across all asset classes and therefore you need to include a share trading obligation. Of course, we forgot that, you know, that meant that the US had to be comparable. So grappling around trying to get equivalence for the US share trading obligation was really difficult. All exchanges in the US are actually self-regulating organizations. How on earth can they be comparable to MIFID II regulation in terms of, of the depth of, of, of regulation that they have to conform to? But they are equivalent because it was necessary for EU firms to be able to access the US markets. So, you know, when you've got this moving target, it's so difficult to talk about equivalence. And I think we need to move away from it. The UK and I hope the regulators in the UK are now deciding they want good, smart regulation. And smart regulation means that they take the good bits from wherever it comes and they apply them diligently. The bad bits they remove and they take away. And if they can get to the stage, I mean, principles-based legislation always worries me because every time you actually give people the option of a complete blank sheet of paper, 
if you give it to 100 firms, you'll get 100 different answers and there'll be nothing comparable. They need at least a basic framework to work to. But a basic framework means an outcomes-based solution. And I think if we move to outcomes-based legislation going forwards, that allows that discretion. So if you've got different ways of getting there, different ways of, of delivering the outcome, that's perfectly acceptable, rather than the tick box rules-based system that has emerged from Brussels. So I think we've got some big things, but my biggest concern right now is that the UK concentrates on things like that framework and it looks inwards and it spends too much time actually trying to get the perfect system going forwards rather than actually saying, do you know what, we just need to have an outcomes-based framework, we'll take the best policies from wherever they've come, we'll adopt them temporarily and we'll evolve as we need to because they need to be outward looking, not inward looking. The more time they spend on their own systems, looking at their own rule book, going through all those thousands of pages, the less time they'll be looking at the forward looking policies that will actually set them up for their future market. But what, what is the view in Brussels on an outcome based system? I mean, Brussels says no, thank you. It doesn't work and it doesn't work because they know they need to keep 27 countries together on the same rule book. The only way they can do that is to be very prescriptive and to actually make sure that every single bit of, of the discretion where they can is taken away because every regulator in the national member state will apply those rules differently if they can. Whereas actually the less wriggle room they've got the, the better the EU financial system thinks it works. And, and the commission believes that they need to rule that with a very strong rule book that's highly prescriptive and outcomes doesn't cut it because they want each level to be seen to be done. Um, the reality for me is that, that that doesn't work. It's where we have most of our complaints from firms, particularly when they find new technology that helps them get to the outcome quicker and more efficiently and actually safe more safely. So for me, you know, you need to now decide you're not chasing equivalence. You're not chasing those move, moving goalposts. You're going to be a strong market leader. You're going to set a strong regulatory policy of your own and you're going to actually apply it in a proper proportionate way. And really? so it's smarter regulation rather than trying to follow what is a, a compromise legislation. The EU has to have compromises. In financial services, they've done almost all regulations since the crisis, mm -hmm. deliberately to take away any member state's discretion that would apply in a directive. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, we have to move away from chasing that moving target. Um, do we actually have the freedom to do that? I mean, Andrew, what's, what's your view on that? That may be normatively desirable, but can you actually do it, um, given the importance of the, U of the EU to the UK financial services sector? I mean, to, to, I, 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 to a certain extent, I mean, you, you, you know, you have to. I mean, the EU financial service sector, you know, we, we can no longer control what the EU does in terms of its own regulation. I mean, you know, people like Kay did their best while they were there. And I think, you know, the certain, certainly the, the, uh, the evolution of EU financial services regulation, you know, I think we've got to recognise the fact that, you know, the UK did actually have a major role in defining it and, and it helping its evolution in the way it did, not perfect. And, and you know, the point about it needed to apply equally to, to each country um, and those countries needed to be aligned. I think that the, uh, and, and to, to, to Michael's point in terms of, you know, the, some of the, the equivalence determinations that have been made have been made purely historic over history, it, exclusively in the interest of the EU rather than the broader benefits to the marketplace. Um, you know, the, the, the UK regulation needs to evolve. It needs to be much more forward looking. You know, all too often regulations are attempts to fix past problems, not, not really address future direction of, of, of evolution. So I think, you know, the forward looking of regulation, thinking about how the industry is going to evolve, because you know, the industry is evolving anyway. You know, technologies, new technology is going to come on board, new, new issues will emerge, new risks will emerge. Um, and I think it's it's trying to be more forward looking and allow a more flexible but predictable way of way of evolving regulation is going to be in the industry's benefits. And there's only so much the UK can do uh, in, in seeking to to preserve a level of access between the UK and the EU. And um, I mean, uh, 
the end of the day, you know, capital will, will move in, in those markets which can uh, do so in, in a safe and least friction cost way. Um, so, you know, it, it, whilst the, there's no intention for the UK to deregulate, um, nevertheless, <laughs> the regulation needs to be aligned to the requirements and be proportional to the, to the risks it's trying to deal, deal with. Um, and, and evolve and be innovative and, and support firms evolve and be innovative. And I think that's the way the, the UK market will, will be able to move forwards in its role globally, not just in its relationship with the EU. Uh, and and you know, if, if equivalence is going to be a line by line comparison, then it's never going to be achieved. <laughs> well, that's the point, isn't it? Jane, what's your, your thinking on that? Um, well, I suppose, um... I love these conversations. It's all so rational. Of course, we'd love to have outcomes based regulation. Uh, nobody's advocating a race to the bottom in the UK. But what you have what you have all set out is that there will be divergence, which will give the EU plenty of hooks to complain. So won't um, this is actually making me more nervous about disputes in the future. And I'd like to hear perhaps a bit more about how, they, how, the, how those, those will be resolved. Um, actually, it's um, it's a rational blueprint which would work perfectly, except it also gives the EU plenty of scope to make mischief for the UK. In other words, can we is is out, out, output based equivalence realistic given the position of the EU at yeah. the present time? And, and the divergence is inevitable, as we've heard. Yeah. Kay. I mean, I would just draw your attention to the example I gave. You know, the share trading obligation in the US. You know, a self-regulated organization is not comparable to the very strong regulatory regime that EU you know, regulated markets uh, in terms of exchanges are subject to. So if you're comparing you know, the way that EU exchanges are actually regulated versus the US you know, sort of counterparts, there is no comparison. But that's yeah. the US, that's not yeah. the UK. They have made that judgment that they are equivalent so all that means is this is a political decision. So there is nothing to do with line by line. It's yep. nothing, even if we had exactly the same lines today, it would make absolutely no difference because they've made a political decision not to grant it. And, and they, they even now publicly talk about this is the lever they will use to force liquidity out of the London markets into the EU because all those funds which are domiciled in Luxembourg and Dublin, some of which have no other connection with the EU, the capital isn't European in origin, it's not uh, investing in European stocks and shares either, but it will actually force a trading obligation through the EU markets where it possibly can because there's a listing somewhere in Europe. And the reality is that you know those sticks work temporarily, they don't work long term. And actually, I think the EU is doing damage to its own credibility globally by actually withholding equivalence for a market that already was fully line by line equivalent to it. And I use the word equivalent rather than equivalence, because equivalence is this, this political term and, and doesn't exist in terms of other languages in the EU. You know, I spent 45 minutes at three o'clock in the morning in a trialogue trying to explain to people the difference between the word equivalent and equivalence. And, you know, it's incredibly difficult when there is no, yeah, yeah, no other word in other languages for it. So it's very, very difficult to say this is anything other than politics at play. Whatever we do is not going to be good enough until the politicians decide they want to play ball. So I just, we should stop chasing it because the politicians will decide whatever they want ultimately is in their interests. And at the moment, you know, when you see the new digital agenda that's coming out of the EU, where it's all about protecting European assets, European uh, companies, and actually making sure everything is regulated and overseen in Europe, if it's a touching European customers, then you know that actually is quite a, a different Europe to the one I participated in, which was actually global outward looking. This is now repatriating everything, repatriating data. They talk about data sovereignty. They're talking about technological sovereignty. These are terms that were never used when the UK was a member. So the fact that they're now using them means there's been a massive shift. So you know the politics are changing. If they don't want to recognize the UK, the UK needs to look at the rest of the world. And we've got to make sure we do not follow suit. We have to be outward looking and global. 
It's where our strength has always been. And it's what we have to make sure we continue to do. And I really think the reputation of the EU is being damaged right now. Why would you, if you're an Asian asset manager, put money into Europe if you think it's actually going to be ring fenced and it's going to be subject to rules that you think are unnecessary in the global system? If you've got a delegated model globally and the EU is about to change their delegation model to make sure you're overseen by a European regulator, why would you put the money into Europe in the first place? And so I think Europe is potentially damaging its own reputation. And I hope that when all of the headlines die down post January 1st and when things settle and when it's not on the front pages of the FT or the front pages of, of, of our red tops, then I genuinely think we'll start to have a more sensible discussion and things will calm down and Europe will start to, to think about its place in the world again. Wow, that's quite a, that's quite a tough some tough talking from Kay. Do you agree, first of all, Andrew, and then uh, a lawyer speaks, Michael, but uh, Andrew first. Well, I think, I mean, ultimately, you know, the capital will flow, as I said, you know, in, in ways which makes most efficient use of that capital. Um, you know, there are, you know, restrictions in terms of how that can operate at any one point in time because, you know, infrastructures are being built, you know, funds or whatever. Um, and therefore, you can't just change things overnight. But but I think what we you know have seen over many years is that um, the markets will make decisions. Um, nobody can control it, but the markets will decide. And, and if Europe becomes a more expensive place to do business with more, more bureaucracy and more costly regulation, it will become less attractive for the for the world of capital markets. Um, and therefore, you will see some some flows away. Um, it's not going to happen. Nothing. None of this is going to change overnight. But I think it could be quite profound over, you know, four or five years when things start to settle down. Um, if the UK takes the right decisions to look internationally, as it should do, because that's where its strengths are, um, then it stands, uh, you know, a really good, good you know, chance of being being hugely successful in the in the near term. Michael, um, I I think it's an interesting question around. Um, whether Europe is is damaging itself, I think it, it. I know Kay probably knows the the Europeans better than than anybody else here on this call, but it, I think you know sovereignty works both ways, right? And, and in financial services, the the Commissioner and, and others in Brussels have said, you know, look, they they want to have sovereignty over their financial system, and I think it was always unrealistic to expect that some form of um, you know, passporting, e.g., under the the MIFIA third country arrangements, which were not an adequate substitute for passporting in any case, um, would continue after Brexit. Uh, and I think the EU. I, I think where I do agree with Kay is the EU will have to adjust its approach, particularly if the UK maintains a strong presence in the Basel Committee and other international organisations in IOSCO. Um, it, it will be hard for the, if, if the UK is compliant with those rules, I think it will be hard for the EU to turn around and say, look, the, the UK has got a, you know, a deregulatory uh, view of the world and is just trying to outcompete Europe by, by providing lax regulation. I think provided the UK stays involved, and I think all the indications are that they will in those global organizations and standard setters at the FSB in relation to green finance with Mark Carney, then then I think, you know, uh, maybe maybe the EU will be damaged in the long term from not having access to, to these markets. Uh, sorry, having access to, to London as a um, as a financial services hub. I think the other thing I would say, though, is that there are costs for UK financial institutions that are probably highest in the short term in terms of the adjustments that I was talking about in practical terms, but also in the long term, just trying to set up arrangements, if it's in relation to delegation, for example, in relation to the offering of services to German or French clients in the future, just navigating that long term will have a cost for London. Um, and, and it will mean that they will have to navigate a, a world where they talk with their French and German offices if they're a larger financial institution. And all of that has a cost financially, has a cost in terms of the ecosystem, um, 
sort of moving from London in some ways. But I think the, the point that Kay made at the beginning is a good one, that actually the EU has not concentrated on one financial centre. It's not declared that Frankfurt will be the new EU financial services hub. And so you will have costs across the EU and, and possibly also passed on to London by having that decentralisation um, of, of financial markets. And what, one other interesting point, I, we mentioned at the beginning the overseas persons regime, and I think that was a very good point around that does need reform. Um, the financial services bill uh, published earlier on this year uh, posed or would give the power to actually suspend the overseas person regime um, where a country was deemed equivalent for MIFIA purposes and forced people to provide financial services through the MIFIA third country regime as the UK version of MIFIA. Um, which actually I think would impose additional costs in terms of transparency and reporting on firms wanting to provide services into London. So maybe it's going the wrong way, but I, I, I think it is a good idea to look at the overseas persons regime and the way it works to try and make it fit for purpose for, for the next 10 years and for London's um, prospects of attracting new business. We've run over. A last word from Jane. What, what's your takeaway from what you've heard? Well, the uh, one is um, the, the high moment is oh, it's still it's all politics, um, oh. and, and you know which means that it's very difficult to to follow some, some of the many rational and practical uh, paths that uh, that um, all, all three of you have have, have laid out. Ver Michael's um, point about actually the EU is a rule taker more than one um, more than is ever publicised is very important. Um, and I'm expecting that the UK will indeed retain a strong role in all those uh, multilateral um, standard setting organisations from which the EU takes rules. And that, so that gives me some hope. Um, and um, I suppose that, um, but I, I, I still think that in the politics of it, what I would be waiting for is the idea that you can have divergence in the sense of being different, but doing the same getting the same outcome uh, equally well um, and that that will be accepted rather than any form of divergence is an excuse to say, uh, you know, that's worse and there's going to be some sort of dispute and further frictions. Okay, a last word from Andrew and Kay. If, what would you want to see from the UK government at the present time to get it over this short-term hump that we all all agree is going to be very difficult over the next few months. Andrew first. Well, I mean, I think, you know, actually recognising the importance of financial services would be a big step forward. <laughs> um, <laughs> unfortunately, you know, it's been, you know, the, the poor cousin in terms of the negotiations, and it's been, you know, a... a, a you know, political target ever since the financial crisis. Uh, and I think that, you know, just the, th that needs to change. And I think we need to recognise the importance of it, both to the UK economy and to the global economy. Okay. Imagine yeah, think, we were, uh, we were running the UK government. What uh, would I genuinely agree with, with Andrew. I mean, the city needs to be shown some love. I genuinely think that financial services is the jewel in the crown. Everybody else wants it. So why aren't we showing it the love it deserves? So I, I do genuinely think that in, on FinTech and ESG, there are huge initiatives and they're very aspirational. I think that needs to be extended back to, to the basic financial services that we excel at. You know, whether it's our banks, our insurers, our asset managers, or our private equity teams, whatever they are, they need to actually be demonst you know, demonstrably looked after by the government in the next few months and years. Let's love up bankers. That's a wonderful point on which to, to end. Can I thank Kay? Can I thank Andrew? Can I thank Michael and my colleague Jane? And of course, all of you for watching. Many thanks.